technical difficulties. So I'm trying to delay this as long as I can. But we're going to go ahead. Timmy gets what I want. It's good. He's good. So, at the end, okay. All right, so we'll start off with some uh, announcements this morning. And you can get them in your bulletin. The Women's Summer Book Club, it's a little dark for me. <laughs> we'll meet Friday the 28th at 6.30. Of course, you know who to talk to. Christy will take care of that. Choir rehearsal will begin again on June 30th. There will be no First Sunday Fellowship in July because <laughs> because of oh y'all don't you, you know I was calling her yesterday she was you'd have to see the pictures but she was Dora the Explorer yes <laughs> at, at, at vacation Bible school it was I couldn't believe it y'all do, do y'all know that cartoon <laughs> it was really good she was really good. Unfortunately, I didn't get the pictures downloaded. But. Okay, so let's talk about the July 4th thing. That's going to be on Thursday from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. And we've done this for several years, and we can't blame Rain on Jason because this 4th of July has been planned for two over 200 years. So <laughs> anyway, we'll be looking forward to that. The church will provide hamburgers and hot dogs which are really good. Mark's going to be doing the cooking, I heard. Right? Well, he's being disturbed back there. Uh, Lop. Flores is here today. Norma, Fernanda. Uh, y'all going to be doing, uh, y'all going to be leading this, in case you didn't know that. But anyway, Anyway, you can sign up to bring sides. All the sign-up sheets are in there if you can get past the snake. And uh, we're going to have desserts, condiments, and to sign up and drinks. There's a sign-up sheet in the foyer. Make sure you join us. It's a lot of fun. It's a pretty hot, but it's pretty fun. And there's a pie contest. I've already told Christy how I was going to win it because I'm going to get me a pie from someone, dump it out of the package, and put it in there, and I'm going to cook it. And it looks real good. So anyway, we, I don't know who's going to be the judge. We don't know who the judges are going to be yet. But I tell you, I know there's some funny things that go on with that contest. Some behind the back stuff that just, you wouldn't think a church that would happen at church. It was a lot of workers. And I don't, I, I guess, where's Lauren? She's going to take care. She, Lauren's going to, I don't know if you're going to name all your volunteers, but there was a lot for the three days. And then I know Sharon and Cynthia were up here yesterday, made a big thing about the cleaning up this area. And uh, so that was good. And Lewis and his bunch did the mowing, it looks real good. Not as good as me, but he did pretty good. <laughs> All right. Are you ready for the VBS thing? All right. Jesus, rain, that's right. 
Well, good morning, Grace. Welcome to the jungle this morning. <laughs> and I think it was a few Sundays ago I mentioned we're not going to do snakes in our church, and there's a snake in the foyer. <laughs> so things are changing here very quickly. <laughs> But uh, we had a really good time. I think uh, the workers may have had just as a good time, maybe maybe more than the kids. But uh, we had a great showing of kids. Also, a number of kids from the community came, which was exciting. They could hear the gospel. And the kids basically went through the entire Bible in three days, from creation to consummation. So they went from Genesis to Revelation. And we talked about, if the kids remember now, but they were sharp, by the way, and they asked really good questions. But we talked about how everything started out very good. God made everything. He made the heavens and the earth. He made man in his own image. And he came in the garden, it says there in Genesis 3, 6, to walk with the man and the woman in the cool of the day. And there's, there was a fellowship there that God had with humanity. Uh, but that was lost soon after that when Adam and Eve rebelled against God. They, they didn't trust in God. They didn't believe him that he was doing what's best for him, for them, and that he was a good God. They believed the serpent instead. And we talked about how uh, they entered sin, the world became fallen and cursed, Uh, God judged them and they were going to have to die. But in the midst of corruption and the fall, uh, they found, the kids know this really well by now, the Genesis 3.15 promise, that in the midst of judgment and in a curse that God promised them, that there would come a warrior king, as we called him, who was going to come at some point, and he was going to rescue us sinners. Uh, And not only rescue us from our own sin, but rescue us from death and from the serpent. And he was going to restore all of creation and make everything better. Mm -hmm. And so we traced that through the scriptures there. Uh, And we also talked about such things as Noah's Ark, why that God had to flood the earth, that humanity was not getting better, it was getting worse. And then the Tower of Babel and the confusion there. And we continued on until the warrior king came. And kids, you remember that he did not come maybe in the way we would expect a warrior king to come, right? He came in a very humble way as a baby. He became one of us. And then he even became more humble and he died on the cross for our sins. And so the warrior king did not come and just chase Satan out of here. Uh, He didn't just set up his kingdom. He came and he died for us. And we talked about how Jesus died for our sins, right? And that all we need to do is trust in him. Trust in him that he can save us and forgive us of all of our sins. Uh, And we just need to believe his word. We need to do the opposite of what the serpent said. The, uh, The serpent wanted us to question the word of God, but we want to believe what God tells us. And so we did that. And then we fast forwarded to the fact that he rose from the grave He went to heaven, but that wasn't the end of the story, right, kids? What was the end of the story? Yeah, that big word, consummation, right? Um, That he would return. He would return as the king of kings. He would set up his kingdom. He would rule over everything. He would restore all kinds of things. People would be healed. The animal kingdom would be restored. And eventually he'd hand it over to the Father, and there would be a new earth, and there would be no sin no death, no evil, no Satan anymore, and everything would be very good like it was in the beginning, and it would be even better. And that's what we learned. So we did the Bible very quickly, and the kids are ready to go. So it was a real delight, real treat to minister to them, and we just pray. Pray that the Lord work in their hearts, and they keep what they learned, and they continue to pursue Jesus Christ. So... Thank you, guys. I don't know who's next. Lauren, are you, are you coming up? And so Lauren, by the way, she comes up. She was the one that put all this together. Um, she spent a lot of time on, on decorations and planning and organizing us and doing all this stuff. And so we're so thankful that for all you've done. So please come on up here, Lauren. Hi guys. Hi. All right. I was going to first, can we ask all of our volunteers to stand up, whether you serve the day of or prior to? <clears throat> Christy, Christy. Thank you all for serving. We couldn't have had three days of VBS without any of you, so thank you so much. Um, 
can I get all the children who attended VBS to come line over here for me? We're going to present them with a certificate of completion for going through the Bible in three days and learning the seven seas of history. Miss Rachel Whitley, <laughs> Rebecca, <laughs> and we have Gabe. Otherwise known as Roland the Second. <laughs> and then we have Arthur. It was really amazing that I don't know how many people helped Lauren, but I know she was up here a lot uh, for the last two or three weeks, and you can see all the decorations. The imagination is there. You ready, Timmy? Uh, well, Will you let Tom thank the volunteers for the painting? Okay, I'll do that as soon as we see what happens when you volunteer. No, I'm telling you. <laughs> This was yesterday. You're going to be amazed at this, that he's here today. Can you see it? You see these funny, well, it's funny now, but you see these videos on your phone, and you, well, that's funny, but then when it happens to somebody that you know, wow, we're going to try to get this on TV. <laughs> All right. 
Let's all stand and start off with nine. Uh, wait a minute. Yeah, Tom, come on up here. All right. You're good right there. told you you told me you asked me to get up on the roof with you and I said no and that's exactly why right there because I would be in a casket right here probably today let's all stand and sing 92 God of grace and God of glory announcement. Uh, if you're free Friday night and you're interested, come out. Uh, we're going to do evangelism over at the Woodlands Waterway at 7. So any, any members here, you all are welcome to come out. Um, if you haven't done evangelism or haven't done it in a long time, come out anyway. It's a great time. We talk to all kinds of people and um, share the gospel. So um, I'm just going to read a few verses from Psalm 86 and then we can praise our God. So 
Uh, Psalm 86, verse 5 says, or verse 8 rather, There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, there are, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. Let's pray. Praise our God. O Heavenly Father, you are so rich in mercy. Your steadfast love never ceases. It's new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Lord, you are faithful to your own character, to yourself, Lord, that you always keep your promises. Lord, not one of your words shall fail. Lord, there's no shifting or turning in you. You are the author of all good things. Every good thing comes from you. Lord, and most of all, Lord, the gift of salvation, Lord, that you have granted us salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, that we who were far off, we who were bound in sin, Lord, that were in darkness, that were darkness, Lord, that you have delivered us, transferred us to the kingdom of your beloved Son. Lord, that you have brought us from darkness to light. Lord, the ones who were dead, you have made alive in Christ. Lord, you have delivered our soul from Sheol, from the power of death, and from the fear of death, that we would be held captive to it our whole life long, you have delivered us from that. And now we can sing and praise you. We can praise your name because you have done great things. You've done marvelous things, Lord. You alone are God. You are great. You are exalted, Lord. And you have demonstrated your power, your authority in creation. We see that your mighty hand and the things that you have made in this universe, right on down to nanoparticles and uh, microorganisms and, and things that we can't see with our, with our bare eye, but that you have made all these wonders, Lord, to display your power, your authority, your greatness. And yet even the, the greater, greater, Lord, is that you have delivered us from the sin, power of sin and death, Lord, through the Lord Jesus Christ, that in Adam all die, but in Christ all will be made alive, Lord. Everyone who trusts in you will be made new that will be brought to life, Lord. You have done great things, marvelous things, and Lord, we want to praise you and exalt you today. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the power of your word, Lord, that teaches us, that changes us, that transforms us by the power of your spirit, so that we can be transformed into your likeness, Lord, that we can be made more like the Lord Jesus Christ, that we can magnify you, that we can proclaim you better. Lord, we pray that we would do those things, that we would pursue you, that we would proclaim you, Lord, that we would love you. And it would be for your glory, Lord, as a response for what you've done, the great things that you've done, that you have delivered our soul from death, from hell even. Lord, we praise you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand once more and sing hymn three. Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him. <laughs> him three.
turn to 385 and sing more love to thee, O Christ. As Brother Atticus is going to be preaching a lot about Christ today. 385. to lift our hearts to you this morning and to give you praise. Lord, we thank you for the riches of your word, which tell us a true history of humanity. Lord, we thank you that you had made everything very good. Uh, Lord, and you graciously gave us life. You gave us the world to enjoy. Uh, you demonstrated yourself to be good in every way. Lord, we live every day with the reality that we rebelled against you. We chose to not trust your word. We chose to not trust your goodness, uh, that you really did what's best for us. And we, we, we believed a lie, a, a deception. Lord, and you kept your word that we were cast out of the garden, that we entered a fallen world, a cursed world. Uh, we even have faced the reality of not only death, but not having that fellowship with you uh, and not having the ability to save ourselves or to rescue ourselves. Uh, Lord, we needed you to rescue us. We, we were unable to do anything good, unable to uh, fix our situation, unable to fix the world around us. And Lord, to show your goodness more, even beyond creation, you showed your goodness and redemption. Uh, that you would send your only son, that you would give up your only son on our behalf, that he would come and take on flesh, he would dwell among us, he would live the perfect life, he would glorify you in every way, he would be the perfect Adam, and then he would then give his life for us. And Lord, in your masterful wisdom, 
you would demonstrate both your justice and your mercy and grace on that cross as the son died. That you would show us that you do deal, deal with sin and evil because you would even punish your own perfect innocent son because he took sin upon himself. And yet, Lord, at the same time, we find at the cross that that's the means of grace and mercy and forgiveness. And the world, Lord, sees us as foolishness. They see a crucified Messiah as a picture of folly. And yet we find there it's the wisdom of God. It's the power of God. It's the goodness of God. Lord, we thank you that your son came and he did that for your glory and for our good, that he rose on the third day triumphantly over death, showing that those who believe in him really will be justified. We really can be made right with you. We can be forgiven of our sins. We can have eternal life through Christ. Lord, we thank you for the children. We thank you for all the children that were here, that are here even this morning. Uh, Lord, they've heard the, this good news. They've seen Christians around them. Uh, Lord, would you please work in their heart and draw them to yourself and save their souls, Lord. Uh, please spare them from eternal damnation, Lord. Uh, none of us deserve that. None of us deserve your grace. Uh, Lord, we are all undeserving of it. We all fall short of the glory of God. And we pray that you might be merciful to them, that they would grow as, as men and women who would come to know you and would live lives for you, who would have fellowship with you and enjoy the sweet pleasure of being with you forever. Lord, we love you. And we thank you for the gospel, the good news of your son. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Would everybody please rise as Brother Jesse Matlock brings our reading from Psalm 46. morning psalm 46 it says to the choir master of the sons of korah according to alamoth a song god is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble therefore we will not fear though the earth gives way though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea though its waters roar and foam though the mountains tremble at its swelling there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. And we're going to sing about that right now. Hymn 53, a mighty fortress, fortress is our God.
Brother Danny Powell, would you come pray for Brother Atticus and the message this morning? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today thankful that we can acknowledge you as our creator. Lord, thank you today that you have saved us. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your word that has gone forth this week to the children. And I just pray that you would bear fruit through that, Lord. I thank you that every Sunday your word is preached at this church. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to bear fruit as I know you have um, in the past. I just thank you today, Lord, for how you have protected and blessed Atticus uh, yesterday. And I thank you for his family, for Lauren and their service, and I just pray that you would bless them as a family. Lord, I pray that you would help us as we hear your word today. I thank you most of all for the Lord Jesus Christ, for salvation in him, Lord, for his blood that was superior to any sacrifice that he could atone for us, that we would be able to dwell with you. And we thank you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I'm overwhelmed with a sense of love and gratitude for you all. Thomas Watson records the prayer of a widow who sat down to a piece of bread and some water for her dinner, and she prayed thus. She said, Lord, all this and Christ, and beloved, I'm just so grateful to you all, my wife, my children, the church, the faithful servants, the faithful men and women who pray that we'll never see or hear of, perhaps, but I think we see their benefits. We see hearts turning, so I'm just so grateful to you all and grateful to the Lord. So I have a question. We're all here, all of us, but why have we all come this morning? What are we doing here? Like the Lord's words, what what did you go out forth to see? What have we come here for individually? I fear that in many, many churches around the world today, especially in our country or perhaps the Western world, it can be said of most of the people there, what was said of the Ephesian writers, that they all came together, but no one knows what for. What are we doing? We may all collectively have an answer of we're here to hear the word preached, we're here to see a preacher, we're here to sing songs, we're here to praise, but I want to know, I want us all to examine individually, why have I showed up today? What was the driving thought as I got out of bed? What was I thinking when I was brushing my teeth and gathering the kids? What was the urging, pressing thought upon my mind? The one thing that I'm striving after to do all this. What was it for? Were you excited or desperate or anticipating something to happen for you to come here today? John 12, 21. It's not our text for the day, but the word was put upon me when I was meditating for the sermon I thought I was going to be preaching, but the Lord, I think and redirected me, and the question, or the, the request, rather, from the Greeks in the book of John, they go to Philip and they say, Sir, in the King James, we would see Jesus. Every other version seems to say, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. They wish to see Jesus. Beloved, that, that statement just kept ringing in my mind as I was preparing what I thought I was going to preach upon, and it was put to me, I think, by the Spirit himself, would I see Jesus? Do I, do I demand that of my day when I wake up? Do I grab my Bible with such eagerness and excitement and say, away world, for right now, I wish to see Jesus? Were we thinking that this morning? Were we contending to wrestle with the kids and get them dressed and get all ready because we were desperate that we should see Jesus this morning? Was it in our thoughts? Is that what we're thinking Or were we thinking, man, there's that girl at church. I got to get up. I'm getting dressed really for her. I'm I'm making sure I'm there early for her. Or perhaps young men tend to love to debate. Are we just so excited to continue on crossing swords and 
iron sharpening iron? Are we here to debate and wrestle with some theological terms? Or were you thinking, I would see Jesus this morning? I must see Jesus this morning. It's an individual question for each one of us. Would we see Jesus? And if it wasn't in your mind this morning or this week or at all, or maybe if it was, maybe it was your thought. I mean, man, maybe some of you just wake up and every moment demanding that of that moment and of that experience, whatever is happening that you would love to see and wish to see Jesus in these very moments, I commend you and I envy you, brethren. I wish I had such a heart that could love him as he deserves. But you want to ask if that's not our heart, if that's not the condition of our mind, it's not, not at the forefront that we desire to see our Lord. I mean, why not is then the follow-up question, of course. Why do we not anticipate with great eagerness and excitement the beholding of our Lord. Are we, are we ignorant of that we even should be doing that? I mean, do we even think, I mean, do we even know that we should be seeking to know our Lord and to see him and to expect that he should work some grace in us this day? Are we just ignorant of that fact? That verse that I quoted does not, it's not a command that we need to wish to see Jesus, but I think they're right in their endeavors. I don't know what they expected to see him for, but right. Should I expect to see the Lord? Do we know that we should be looking for him? Are we just indifferent? Maybe someone has told you that salvation is through Christ alone and he is worthy of all praise and honor and we just don't really care because we're busy or we're doing something else. Are we lazy? Do we know this? We know it's right and then we just don't consider him at all. We just don't do the work it takes to remember the Lord. Or are we hiding? Are we ashamed, perhaps? Are we embarrassed by some sin? Are we embarrassed by some even personal failure? We, we feel we can't go to him. I think all of it is really ignorance. If we're ashamed, then we're ignorant of his grace and his love and his mercy. If we're lazy towards seeking him, then we're ignorant of how worthy and how precious and how valuable he is. If we're indifferent, it's the same. We're just ignorant of this Jesus Christ. So what puts him out of our thoughts? What puts him out of our intentions? Why does he seem so far from us so many times? I ultimately cannot say for each individual. I know my own heart and I know the bitterness therein and I I can't say exactly what you need to do in order to cure yourself of this indifference or this lack of pondering Christ. Satan, we know, we're, we're very much at war here, Satan is adamant that we should not see Jesus Christ. For the God of this world has blinded the minds of the, of the unbelievers so they cannot see the glory of the light of Christ in the gospel. Sin would have us not ponder and seek the Lord. Your sins have separated you from your God, O Israel. Yet, we have such opposition to this. Our own heart seems so opposed to loving Christ and meditating upon him. But yet the fullness of the Trinity would that you should see the Lord Jesus Christ. The Son says that he will go and he'll take on flesh, incarnating as a man so that man can see Christ. The Holy Spirit empowers him, even conceives him within the womb of Mary, so that man should behold the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Father so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whomsoever should believe on him should have everlasting life. The Father desires that we should see the Lord Jesus Christ. So this wasn't going to be my sermon. I had purpose. This is my seventh sermon I've ever preached. And a little background as to why I'm preaching what I'm preaching is about six months ago, knowing that I probably would be called upon to preach again, I thought, oh, what have I preached on so far? And examining the topics I've covered, I thought, oh, I haven't just preached on Christ himself. should do that. I mean, that's, you kind of think that should have been my first thing. So I thought, okay, that's fine. I'll preach on Christ. I know the scriptures well. I know a lot of theology and a lot of books. And so I just said in my heart, okay, I'll start thinking of a sermon to preach about Christ. And my friends, for the last six months, I've been in such turmoil and confusion of heart and mind because I had no sense as to how to approach this subject whatsoever. For indeed, it's not a subject. It's the living God, the risen Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father, is the subject and the topic. 
and for six months, I felt as if there was no way to approach this at all. I've shared this dread that I've had of this for, with some of you, and y'all have been some great help, and I believe that y'all have prayed for me, but it left me weary and woeful. I had no delight and no pleasure in any theological discussion or debate or any concepts. No praise could be received because I felt so unable to preach the Lord Christ as if I was unfamiliar with him. All the books of theology, all the scripture rose up against me to condemn me, just like the Lord's words to the Pharisees were, you search the scriptures thinking you have in them eternal life, but it's they that testify about me. And by God's grace, I believe I've found some success in understanding the Lord. He's quickened a verse to me, a whole little section here. If you want to go to Proverbs 30, I'll give you an insight as to this problem that man seems to have in knowing Christ. Proverbs 30 is my favorite proverb, and more so even now. The words of Agur, son of Jeke, the oracle. The man declares, I am weary, O God. I am weary, O God, and worn out. Surely I am too stupid to be a man. I have not the understanding of a man. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I knowledge of the Holy One. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the winds in his fists? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established the ends of the earth? What is his name? What is his son's name? Surely you know. I feel even more kindred spirit with Agur. Notice he can, he can recite the works of God. He knows that the Lord gathers the winds in his fists. He knows that God is the creator. He knows that he's wrapped up the waters in the garment. He's established the ends of the earth. This man is, is an inspired writer of scripture, and he knows the works of God. Brethren, I can tell you that Jesus Christ walked on water, rose from the dead, raised the little girl to life, raised the widow woman's son to life. I can tell you of God's works of old, blinding the armies of the Assyrians, raising the dead in the Old Testament, parting the Red Sea. I can tell you of his works, and I can recite them as if he's a character in history. But like Agir, he asks, who has done this thing? What is the nature and character of this being, this God? What do those works tell us about him? Who is he escapes him yet still? What a terror. He's weary and he's worn out. So who is he? Who has done all of this? I mean, truly, in these last six months, I've come to know that no one knows the Son except the Father. And it is so true, beloved. I'm so desperate now of all things, not to win arguments and not to be theologically perfect, but I would love to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And all these things shall be added unto us, brethren, if we would just demand and pray it fervently and earnestly and say, I desire to see Jesus. I want to know who this is. The Father is willing that we should know him. So back to our text, these Greeks, what do they mean? I mean, what is meant by see Jesus? I mean, it sounds unspiritual, right? We think that there's, I think one of my issues is, is he's become so ethereal, perhaps, as a subject or as a topic, like a person or character in history, intangible. Like we can read about Alexander the Great. We can read about Hannibal the Great. I mean, again, we can, I can tell you about Hannibal traveling through the Swiss Alps, bringing elephants and treading through the swamp. We can tell you about the facts of the Battle of Cannae, all the great things that Hannibal did that are amazing. I will never know him. I'm not going to know him. And for some reason, I feel the same, I felt for a long time, the same kind of thing towards the Lord. I can tell you his facts. But yet, unlike Hannibal, unlike Alexander, unlike any person throughout history whom we know about, the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and he's seated at the right hand of God, waiting and expecting that we should join him one day. Very different. Knowing Christ is a future reality and a present one as well. So what is meant by see Jesus? Surely it means some kind of experience, mystical thing. I have two points on that. And that it's, it's we, first of all, it's physically. I mean, I think they simply mean we want to see Jesus. 
They want to behold him. Are the rumors true? Is he really as tall as everyone says? I mean, what does he look like? There's a curiosity in man that we desire to see things. So right off the bat, the first way is meant by see Jesus is physically, naturally, immediate. We'll be in proximity with him that we should behold and see him. But it also comes with an expectation, I think. Obviously, I don't think they would walk up, see Jesus, see what he looks like, ask him to turn around, see the back, and then, okay, we, that's what we came for. We just wanted to look. We have this expression. We, it comes with an expectation. I, wa- I went to see my doctor. No one asks what he looks like after someone declares they went to go see the doctor. They say, what, is he, what did he do for you? Right? What's going on? I went to go see so-and-so in concert. You didn't go just to look at them and get out of there. It's a, there's an expectation that they are going to fulfill something for us. Do we think about the Lord that way? That we should one day behold him physically, actually, with our eyes and have our desires satisfied therein. Sight, to see something seems to enhance all experience. And sight in and of itself is enjoyable. Just to behold the Lord would be a joy in and of itself. And so so men have desired to see Jesus physically in the incarnation. We clearly don't have that with us today, and we'll go into that a little bit later. And then the second meaning of how can one see Jesus, and what do I mean when I keep saying this? I do mean physically. Would you see the Lord Jesus Christ with your eyes, physically, in person? Do you desire that? Do you think about it? Do you long for it? And then, of course, there's seeing the Lord by faith. Seeing the Lord by faith. Hebrews 12 says that we are looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, knowing that Jesus is not to be seen on the earth. But there is a scene of Christ by faith, and I think that'll be the next sermon. So a little bit about sight. I want to talk about sight, meditating on this topic to realize that the Lord Jesus Christ, the word of God has been made manifest that we should behold him with our eyes is something very wonderful. I can't, I can't tell you why that is so, but that we should be satisfied in our senses with God himself is very interesting to me. It's the first sense ever mentioned, sight is, it's the first sense ever mentioned in the, in the scriptures, I thought that was fascinating. God saw the light and that it was good. Very interesting. First sense to be gratified in creation. He saw the light, it was good. He made trees that were a, de, a delight to the eye to see. There's a big emphasis on sight. Just meditating on it scientifically is fascinating. Light travels 880,000 times faster than the speed of sound. It's as if God has designed the creation to be rushing that you should behold the glories of God in the creation. It's, the creation itself is eager that we should see things as light being the medium by which we see all things. I would argue, too, that it's the most useful of all the senses God has made. I believe it's preeminent. I know some of the musicians are really, like, they think hearing's, hearing's it. But I think if we put you to it, if you, you had to choose between sight and vision, I think, I think practically we would all pick sight. It's so useful, so helpful. Thinking about the way we imagine things, it seems to manifest. The imagination manifests itself with something to be seen, which I think is very fascinating. So God uses sight, I think, as the chief sense to manifest his glory. In that Christ himself is the image of the invisible God. That we should behold Christ is something I'm going to now convince you of. So let me ask you this. My, still my question, would you see Jesus? Do you desire to see Jesus physically? Do you ever think about that? Or is he, like I struggle with, some maybe ephemeral, ethereal, non-substantive character in your mind, in history? Or have you ever prayed, God, I desire to see Jesus with my eyes. It seems so unspiritual, but let me give you some scriptures. To see God actually and literally, again, is too wonderful. I cannot explain to you what it means and what all will and all that will entail. But that it is, in fact, our future where we're going, those who have put our trust and faith in him, we shall behold the Lord Jesus Christ with our eyes. They shall look on him whom they have pierced. They shall look on him. The incarnation itself is Christ, God manifest in the flesh. The whole incarnation reveals that we will behold God. What about Isaiah? I saw the Lord high and lifted up, right? Even in our dreams, I'll take Joseph's, even in his dream he beheld the Lord. 
he dreamt of the ladder and the angels of heaven ascending and descending. And he says, behold, at the top of the ladder stood the Lord. So we are to see the Lord, for he is the radiance of God's glory. Hebrews, he is the radiance of the glory of God. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The blessing in and of itself is that we shall see and behold God. So are we expecting this? This is for the future, beloved. So now our text, John 17, 24. This is... The Lord's, it's called high priestly prayer. It could be called the Lord's prayer. The most glorious prayer, I think, in all of scripture. And he is praying to the Father before he suffers and dies upon the cross. And he prays for himself and he prays for us. And the last request he makes for us in this prayer is this. He says, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me should be with me where I am to behold my glory that thou, hast given, that thou hast given me because thou hast loved me before the world began. He desires that we should be with him where he is and to do what? To gaze upon, to behold his glory. That prayer has been fulfilled for the last 2,000 years and is still being fulfilled, beloved. And he prayed that to the Father, the most gracious Father who gives every good and perfect gift and a prayer prayed by the most glorious intercessor to have ever walked the earth. Beloved, this is it's a sure thing. It's done. This is our future. Do we think about it? Do we get excited that I'm going to see God? I'm going to see Christ in all of his glory and I will be with him where he is. What do we do with it? He prayed it out loud, beloved. He didn't pray this in his heart and this wasn't hidden from us by the Spirit. It's recorded that we have ought to do with it. What do we do with this? So I had purpose to preach Christ. When I finally thought I had a sense to preach him, I thought I will, I will preach the text that we are to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of, light into, out of darkness into his marvelous light. So I had sat down ready to preach or to prepare a sermon to preach the excellencies of Christ. And the Spirit just kept asking me. I felt like in the qu- Quoting the verse, would you see Jesus? What was my problem all that time? I was not really, all those six months or even longer than that, my heart did not desire to see the Lord. So we start here, I think. My intro to that sermon became two sermons, so I'm sorry for that. But so we are to see the Lord. We need to be expecting this. This is a future thing. There is nothing that we can do to hasten this sort of thing. But it's said, and we are to be encouraged, motivated, comforted, and make this our goal, to expect to see the Lord Jesus Christ. So he said it out loud. So he, he, he says it to comfort us. First of all, if you want some points, I'll tell you what we are to do with Jesus declaring to us that we shall behold his glory. First of all, we are to take encouragement, motivation from this that he has said. It's just like Joseph in Egypt. I mean, Joseph has been gone from his father. His father is weary, near death, ready to die at any bad news that comes his way. And Joseph, revealing himself to his brothers, is so adamant to see his father again and to bring his father. And what does he say to his brothers? He says, go and tell my father of all my glory in Egypt. What is the point of that? To encourage the reality of the richness and the blessing that Joseph has attained should inspire and revive his father. And very much so it does. Go and read it in Genesis 45. In verse 13, he says, Go and tell my father of all my glory in Egypt. In 27, the brothers go back, and they're explaining Joseph is alive, and he's, he's ready to die just at the news, thinking that they're, that, that they're messing with him. But then when he, he says he saw the carts full of all the treasure, and he saw a little taste of that glory, was sent back. A little bit of it was experienced tangibly for his father. It says that his heart revived. So this reality that we will behold the glory of Christ is to rouse us, beloved, to get excited about these things. Where are we going? We're going to stand before the Lord and to see his glory. 
Let us bestir ourselves to this purpose. David says this in the psalm. He says, one thing I have asked of the Lord, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever and gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Man, guys, let me tell you about the patriarch David. Greatest king of all of Israel, undefeatable in battle. He slayed his ten thousands. Could no man nor beast could stand before King David, okay? He could fight. He is called the sweet psalmist of Israel. You have this warrior man, and yet he's the sweet psalmist of Israel. How many psalms did David write? How much do we benefit from that man? How much treasure and wealth did he accumulate? How much did he donate? I don't know if we can match his charity, his ability to praise the Lord, his ability to be productive or fight. Truly, he is the greatest king that perhaps has ever walked the earth, besides the Lord. Yet, one thing, he says, it was all for one thing he's asked of the Lord. The one thought regulated all that he did, and it's that he should be with the Lord forever, to gaze upon his beauty forever. That one thought regulated all of those works. That entire life was because he had desired to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. I mean, what sanctification, beloved. What a sanctifying motive for all that we do. Why am I getting the kids dressed? Why are we going to church? Why are we reading the Bible? Why are we demanding that the teaching should be scriptural? It's because it reveals the Lord Jesus Christ. And to bring us to him by faith, that's our goal. This is the end game, beloved. And I think we profit well to keep it in our minds. And I'm meditating upon this a little bit more. I mean, this is David's one thought, excited. I will see and gaze upon the Lord. And I started thinking about all these other religions out there. They all want to say something about Christ. You know, the Muslims, guys, the Muslims do not want this. They do not want to be with the Lord Jesus Christ forever. And they do not want to gaze upon his glory forever. They don't believe that he has a glory that of God, the Father. They don't believe God is a Father, but they, they do not desire to see the glory of Christ. This is not their motivation for anything that they do. They will not have him. Not to be too harsh on the Catholics, but I wonder about what, what the Catholics do with this. The Lord Jesus Christ. Look at his heart in that prayer. Father, I desire that those whom you have given me should be with me where I am. I can't help but think that the Catholics have put so much in between them and Christ that they cannot come to him, that Christ doesn't want them, so they must go to Mary. They're, they're, the whole prayer and meditation system of the Catholics is Mary, saints, and then Christ is here a little bit. Do they realize that Christ wants them where he is to gaze upon his glory? Not the glory of Mary that is never spoken of in Scripture whatsoever, but his real and actual glory. He will bring them to be with him. I mean, man, the sacraments between them and Christ, the, the priesthood, purgatory. I mean, will they ever get to be in the house of the Lord forever to gaze upon the glory of the Lord? I fear for them. I fear the thief. See how that prayer was so fulfilled right then and there. Today, he says to the thief, you will be with me in paradise. You will be with him. I think of just another one, the Jehovah's Witnesses. They loathe the idea that you should behold Christ with your eyes and see his glory manifest in the flesh in heaven. They've reduced Christ to some spirit being, saying that his body is either dissolved in the gases or hidden somewhere and preserved. Nobody can say for sure. It's their official doctrine statement on what to do with the body of Christ. They do not have a Christ that will be visible to behold. They say Christ has come back and is invisibly a spirit, contrary to scripture. Another thought is, though, that this Christ is visible and that the glory of God should be manifest in a, in a human being forever, namely Jesus. Many don't like it. We don't like this real Christ. The Mormons do not want to be with the Lord forever. I mean, I think about what the Mormons' goal is, what they really want. Their attainment is to get their own universe, have their own planets that they'll populate with spirit babies, and they'll do their own thing and be their own gods. Where is the desire to be in the Lord's house forever, not building your own house? They want to see their glory, and they would not see the glory of Christ in his house and to seek him in his temple. They want to be independent and go off and do their own thing. 
So it just blew my mind, beloved, that this is, this is should be the forefront of our thoughts, that we are going to be with the Lord. This is a distinctly biblical Christian desire and privilege and hope that we should be longing for. What else should we do with the fact that we will behold the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ actually, immediately with sight? Beloved, we should draw comfort from this thing. We should draw comfort from this very thought that one day I will stand before my Lord and behold his glory. I think in all the book of Job, the greatest moment in it is Job chapter 19. If you'll go with me to Job chapter 19. Of all the things that are said, much talk, I think this Job gets right. So right. Job 19, 25 through 27. A little background about Job. My point is that you should be comforted from this reality that you shall see God. Job, for those of you who don't know, lost all of his children. He lost all of his wealth. He was the wealthiest man in the whole region. We're talking exceedingly wealthy. And then after losing it all in a day, he was also then tormented with failing health, horrible boils, great pain, and bad friends. And he's, it's a life-changing deal, guys. He's in distress. He can match any one of you, not to disparage your struggles, but beloved, recognize Recognize that there is a comfort to be drawn from this reality if we can keep it in our hearts and in our minds. Job 19, 25 through 27, here's what he says. In the midst of his suffering, he says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. And my eyes shall behold, and not another. What a great comfort. I'm losing it all. It's all going away. Yet I know that I shall see God. What a comfort. We have much we can lose in this world. But beloved, all of it came from Christ. And all of it's still found in Christ. Sometimes he makes our journey light so we can get to him faster, beloved. And he takes these things away. Think about uh, talking about comfort and great distress and hardship, fears and struggles, and they need comfort. And look at that special beholding of Christ granted to that faithful martyr, the first martyr, Stephen. I mean, he's preached his sermon, and he's preached and proclaimed Christ, and they're ready to stone him terrifying moment, life-changing event about to happen to Stephen, and such grace was granted to him that he should be so encouraged, ready to face the stoning, being stoned to death. What happens? He says, behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God. They gnash their teeth at him and take him out and they stone him to death. But I think he was quite comfortable knowing where he was going, having this glorious sight of Christ. Beloved, we should be excited to see Christ. Would you see Christ with your own eyes glorified in heaven is the question, beloved. What about sanctification? This beholding of Christ in the future, knowing that it's a future event, has practical sanctification purposes for us even now. Go to 1 John 3. First John 3, he says this, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Well, this is somewhat mysterious. I can't tell you the mechanisms and the workings of hoping to see and behold the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ ultimately purifies the heart and the soul. I think there's something 
wonderful that the Spirit does as we begin to meditate upon the Lord Jesus Christ. I think we could try to examine it mechanically. How, how would meditating upon the Lord, how would that bring about a purity within our hearts, within our minds, within our conduct? I mean, I think there's a practical example in the world where when we have an object that we so desire and we think about it, we conform to it, we move around our day trying to get to that object of which we are so desperate to behold. We'll begin to leave off and give up things knowing that we have something so desirable for us. I'll use my wife as an example. When we were first talking and I worked at Red Lobster, she was going out with the other work people. I had the two jobs. I worked with her and then I worked the second job. And they were all going out. I was like, oh, this is my chance. I got to get off of work at Red Lobster here and get over to see Lauren at the, at the bar, restaurant. She doesn't drink, but just so you know. Um, but I'm desperate. I want to behold her. I want to be there with her. I want to see her outside of work. I want to, I want to, I expect something, right? So I'm working, laboring at Red Lobster. I'm a waiter. So you have to just get to a certain time and then you're cleaning up. You got to do your side work, get all this done. I got to get out of here. I need to go see Lauren, right? And it's consuming my mind. Every table that I sat, every side work I did, every table I cleaned, everything was all motivated and inspired because I need to see my beloved future wife. And I'm hindered, okay? So people are lazy. They're not doing their work. I got to do extra work. They won't let me leave because other stuff's not done. They're asking me to do it. So I'm, I'm getting desperate now. So I start weighing, is my job even worth it, right? <laughs> like this, this sight, this desire to see my wife, right? Not my wife, but the, you know, the girl I was so attracted to was so strong that I began to think, okay, well, what will I do? This is worth contending with my manager over. This is worth calling everybody else out and making enemies so I can get out of here and go see this object of my beloved, right? And so I did. I quit my job. I argued with my boss. I gave it up just so I could go spend the night. And it was worth it, obviously. It was a good call. It was only Red Lobster, right? So don't think it was a big sacrifice, guys, but I was, I was poor and still poor. But, but what a thing, guys. Look. You're, you're going to see Christ. We're going to see him in his glory. Can we cast off the world, away world? We're done. I have an object. I will give up the things of this world knowing that I'm going to see the Lord Jesus Christ. Thus we purify ourselves. We purify ourselves from the desires and the, and the deceptions of this world, this temporal nothing, the vanity that's going away. We'll say goodbye, falling, crumbling world, for I would see the Lord Jesus Christ instead. I know it's a long Sunday, so we'll, con we'll conclude. So again, would you see the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you desire to see him now? Do you desire to see him after your death? Is that, is that what you're looking forward to? Or is it, oh, I've got to see Grandpa, I've got to see this and that. We'll get to see our friends, beloved. We will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's a glory there. There's a glory to be reunited with family and friends in Christ. But what does David say, though? Right? He says, whom have I in heaven but thee, O Lord? Do you desire to see Jesus after your death? Do you desire to see him at his coming? For the rest of the world, beloved, this is such a privilege for us. The rest of the world, what do they say? They say to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the Lamb, for the day of his great wrath has come. They do not desire to see him at his coming. Jason preached, and I didn't get to hear it, brother, but you preached on assurance and assurance in Christ, that you should be assured because of his love, because of his power. There's many reasons to be assured of, like, of your salvation in Christ. But we should be assured when we desire to see him at his coming. Do you desire to see him in the new earth? Do you desire that he should be the God-man forever? Is that enough for you? It seemed like Stephen struggled with this. He says, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And Jesus says, have I been so long with you, Philip, that you ask of me, show me the Father. Do you not know that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Are we content with that? Do we, like, what do we expect? The glory of God is manifest in the person of Jesus Christ. Do you desire to see him in all of his glory? Beyond you, brethren. The Mormons want to be equals. Many people want to be equals. The New Agers as the New Ager. We're going to be one with God. We want to be up there. We will make our throne like the Most High. No, 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 no. 
You're going to see him in all of his glory, submitting to forever the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you desire to see him in his, on his divine throne? Do you desire to see him with thine own eyes? I mean, it blew my mind that I, don't think, I didn't think about that almost ever, that I'm going to behold him with my eyes, just see him as he is. Moses was so desperate for that. You don't remember that? Like he's on earth, he's a man, he's in an old body, but he says, I mean, he's just desperate. Lord, show me thy glory, right? He was so desperate to see the glory of God with his own eyes. So, so then, brethren, let's be desperate to see the Lord. Let's be desperate to behold him. So then, number one, expect to do it. Expect the Lord Jesus Christ. Expect to see him. Hope for him and hope for this glorious vision, the satisfaction of your sight. Look for him. Look for him. What does it say? That So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will come a second time not to deal with sin, right? But to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Brethren, be eager to see the Lord Christ and his coming. And then live accordingly. Consider that you will stand before him one day. Let that regulate what, what you're doing right now, why you're talking to your wife this way, why you're talking to your husband this way, why you're treating your children this way, why I'm laboring at work. What's the whole point? I'm going to see the Lord one day. I'm laboring. I'm doing all that I'm doing because I plan and hope to see the Lord. And then be encouraged by it. I mean, what an encouragement. What a joy. We'll be in his house forever. And then you must... Last point, last thing to take from it is you must be preparing for this glorious vision of Christ now. You must be preparing to see and behold and live in the presence of God forever now. And the way we're going to do that is going to be this next sermon is the, the way in which we are to prepare and to behold the Lord is, is that we need to behold him by faith. We need to be looking unto Jesus now and discerning by faith all that we can discern and perceive of him now. Because the blessing for us now is, as pronounced to Thomas, blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. So we'll cover what that means next Sunday, Lord willing. Let's pray. I make my last prayer from the lyrics of a song by a beautiful eulogy called Acquired in Heaven. I was listening to it when I was preparing and um, it was such a wonderful time of praise and fellowship in the car by myself and we, uh, we do well. It's meat for us to learn from our betters. So pray with me. Oh Jesus King, most wonderful, thou conqueror renowned, thou love most ineffable in whom all of our joys are found. Oh Jesus, light of all below, Thou fount of life and fire, surpassing all the joys we know and all we can desire. May every heart confess thy name and ever thee adore. In seeking thee, itself in flame, to seek thee more and more. Amen. Let's all stand and sing 379. Right from what Daticus preached about, I'd rather have Jesus 379.
please come forward. said that couldn't be done okay let's all stand and conclude with 403 blessed assurance jesus is mine thank you kyle
Okay. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful once again for our beautiful fellowship, for the gathering of believers. Lord, we're grateful for the message we received from Pastor Atticus, a message of reminder to us all. I believe at some point, most of us here have come to know Christ. I've come to a knowledge of Christ that leads to saving faith. But oftentimes, we, we need to be reminded but part of our sinful nature implies that we forget that which we've learned once. And he's brought a message of remind, remembrance for us to go back perhaps to those moments where we came to know Christ, but to remind it that it is continuous, that we ought to be searching after you to know you intimately, the way we perhaps search after our wives or our husbands to know them personally, to continuously grow to know them that we are in relationship with Jesus. And that relationship is dependent on how much we seek to know him personally. We've been reminded in such a beautiful way that this relationship is not one that grows distance, but is one that should grow closer and closer. Lord, as we're reminded, the, the way you saved us, perhaps at one point, that we are still in need of salvation on a daily basis, that you will continuously conform us to the image of your Son. And as we draw nearer to you in the weeks to come, Lord, that you would nourish our relationship, our friendship, that our joy will be forever full. As a result of that, our works by fellowship, by love for others, will also bring others to saving faith. Lord, in the same way we want our children to know you, that's why we labor over them to teach them your word as we did this past week. Lord, in, in beautiful ways, we pray our fruits would never be in vain as we labor to teach our children the next generation to order their step in righteousness. Lord, I pray that you would take these children into your fold and in your good timing, you would bring them to the end of themselves to commit their lives to you and to establish the next generation of believers for this country needs it. Lord, and their walk would be a testify of the faith we have in you, the faith we have by giving our children to you. And I pray you would nourish them through the preaching of your word, through the reading of scripture. Lord, and I pray that as we go our separate ways that we will continue to labor to know you as parents personally and as a family of believers together. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. One more announcement. Uh, Lauren wanted me to talk about the, there's a vacation Bible school celebration right now in the back building where Atticus fell. Um, right after the service, there'll be cookies, dessert bar, games for the kids, I guess, and a scavenger hunt. All right, that's it. Thank you.